A very good morning to all of you. We warmly welcome you to another session in our webinar series. Uh, this is another webinar organized by the Society for Health Research and Innovation. And today we have a very interesting topic, a very common and very relatable topic for all of us to update our medical knowledge. It is under the topic of common ENT problems we might face in our general practice. Um, let me get into some housekeeping rules before we start our session. As usual, this webinar link will be available from 9 to 9.45 for all of you to join in. No late attendees will be attended thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And these CPD points are strictly adhered to the national CPD guidelines. We have uh, put on these uh, rules and regulations so that to improve and maintain the standards of our CPD programs conducted here at SHRI. We thank you again and again for adhering to these rules and for coming and joining us every Sunday and uh, trying to update your medical knowledge so that you can in, be informed and maintain a very good practice in your work, career. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our very distinguished guest today, my one of my very good bosses who I work under. And um, she is very renowned in her field. She's specially involved in uh, cochlear implants. You must be all knowing her. And uh, this is Dr. Sanjeevani Rupa Singha. She is the consultant ENT, head and neck surgeon attached to the Sri Jayavardhanapura General Hospital. And Madam, I would like to give the floor to you to talk to us about the common ENT problems in general practice. We are trying to uh, cover a very vast topic today. By any chance, if we do not have any time uh, to give to you, deliver to you a very um, informative lecture, we are hoping to break it into two, but we will see how it goes today. Uh, Madam, the floor is yours which we call a uh, 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 um, perichondritis. So here the infection involving the skin as well as the perichondrium of the lining uh, cartilage of the pinna. Uh, usually it's with pseudomonas infection. You get all the uh, features of acute inflammation, redness, swelling, uh, pain, vomit, everything. Uh, so you need to treat this with antibiotics depending on the severity of the uh, infection. Uh, for a Patient, like in this picture, you need systemic antibiotics. If you don't treat it with antibiotics accordingly, the patient will end up with a cauliflower ear because uh, with the inflammation of the perichondrium, the cartilage of the pinna doesn't get enough blood supply, but blood supply is compromised and they tend to uh, end up with avascular necrosis of the cartilage. So it's very sad to see some patients coming to us uh, with uh, uh, emerging cauliflower ear because the perichondritis has not been treated properly. And the next picture. The next picture again is a condition we all come across, but uh, usually uh, misdiagnosed. It's a fluid filled uh, localized swelling of the pinna. And we all thought, think that this is a abscess in the pinna, but it's not. It's a localized fluid filled cystic lesion in the peri uh, pinna. We call it a perichondrial effusion or a perichondrial cyst. Uh, and if you aspirate the perichondrial cyst, you will see a serous fluid a tinge of blood uh, uh, aspirated through the perichondrial cyst. Now, this is again a condition uh, we need to excise, we need to uh, take out all the fluid because again the fluid fills between the cartilage and the perichondrium. So, if you don't uh, treat this properly, again the patient is going to end up with the perichondrial or a, a cauliflower ear. And this is what happens if you don't treat perichondritis or perichondrial cyst timely, uh, uh, properly. So this is one condition where you have to refer to a, a specialized ENT unit uh, because this needs timely intervention. And few pictures of uh, other infections around the ear. Uh, the preauricular sinus or auricular sinuses, these are all congenital. Usually, we don't see the opening of the sinus, but 
they usually present with infection, uh, maybe an abscess or a, a localized uh, uh, redness, uh, uh, signs of inflammation. This again needs acute uh, management with antibiotics, pain relief and all. Once the infection is settled, this preauricular uh, pre sinus or the auricular sinus needs to be surgically excised. Otherwise, we have seen patients coming um, uh, repeatedly uh, with the sinus uh, and infections because we have missed this preauricular or the auricular sinus being the cause for this repeated infection. So this again needs a uh, proper intervention. And we all are familiar with this condition, ear wax. Um, everybody thinks that the ear wax needs to be clean, but it's not. Ear wax does a, 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 a protective, uh, um, it has a protective mechanism. So we normally don't recommend to clean ear wax, but uh, in 10% of the population, this ear wax becomes a problem. 90% of the time, ear wax is produced and it is uh, automatically comes out of the ear canal and we don't see uh, any issue. Uh, ear wax impaction is another common issue where the patient comes with ear pain. So if you have otoscope, just uh, look inside. If you see hard impacted wax, you need to take the wax out. But before that, you need to soften the wax with some uh, wax softening agent. Usually we use sodium bicarbonate, glycerin, olive oil, whatever. And once the wax is softened enough, we need to take it out. Uh, in the specialized centers, we do vacuum the ears. We do... Uh, uh, ear cleaning with a vacuum, but in a GP setting, if you if you are competent enough, you can do a syringing uh, of the ear wax. Uh, but before you prescribe wax solvents, you have to tell the patient that this might uh, worsen the condition because the hard wax will absorb the glycerin or the bicarb and it swells up and the limited space within the canal or uh, uh, makes it very painful. So uh, if you don't tell the patient that may, this might worsen the condition, uh, uh, they, they, will, uh, they will not appreciate it. So if this is very painful, you might not be able to remove it in your GP practice. This needs, again, a referral. And usually we do it under general anesthesia. Otitis externa is another common uh, problem that we encounter. Uh, it is the diffuse inflammation of the skin lining the outer ear canal, usually caused by bacterial or fungal. There are a lot of predisposing factors. Some people are born with very narrow external ear canals and, uh, and also uh, increased sweating, uh, bathing in hot climates where you have uh, moisture trapped inside the ear canal. Uh, predisposes to fungal or bacterial infection. Uh, and sometimes skin diseases like eczema, psoriasis also uh, produce refractory otitis externa. Uh, there's no uh, solution or they, they come with recurrent repeated infections. So the clinical, the salient clinical feature is tragal tenderness. Uh, if you press on the tragus, the patient has pain and there is discharge and also swelling in the outer ear canal. Uh, again, it needs antibiotics, oral usually enough. And if you have facilities, you need to clean the ear and we usually put an ear wick impregnated with some antibiotic steroid combination cream. So that will help the local action, uh, the edema will reduce and uh, it will facilitate the discharge to come out and um, uh, the condition will settle down. And we can use uh, antibiotic eardrops also, but sometimes when you have a lot of discharge in the ear canal, no point putting drops onto that discharge because it's not going to go work. So you need to clean, your, clean the ear before prescribing eardrops. 
and these are some pictures of uh, fungal infections if if you look inside you can see the fungal spores white or black color in aspergillus uh, it's again a very common condition that we see especially in diabetic population um, and this is a picture of uh, uh, keratosis obturans meaning uh, the wax has become uh, so uh, uh, and it has a it has a local pressure effect. Uh, the wax impacted and uh, causing local pressure effects, and we call it a keratosis obturans. Again, a very painful condition, uh, which needs cleaning under anesthesia. And you see a lot of foreign bodies in the ear, uh, small beads, pebbles, and also. Uh, insects like uh, ticks and uh, other insects. So the foreign bodies, there are two types. Uh, small foreign bodies which doesn't absorb water, we can try syringing. But if they are water absorbable, don't try syringing. We have to do it under direct vision, under a microscopic guidance. And uh, people have asked what to do if you find a tick inside the ear canal. Mind you, again, it's a very painful condition. The tick is uh, very resistant to uh, all these available eardrops. So the main aim should be to relieve pain first. So you need pain relief. And if you have anything, anything to put in your ears, like olive oil, coconut oil, whatever, you can put anything in the ear just to, uh, just to try and kill the insect. So if the insect is alive inside the ear canal, it starts uh, uh, damaging the surrounding skin and the ear canal and the condition is very painful. Uh, so uh, if insect sometimes the tick is sitting right on the tympanic membrane so the removal might damage the tympanic membrane so that again needs a referral to the to a specialized unit uh, some we we have seen patients coming to specialized units with uh, ear canal edema uh, due to improper removal of the insect or the tick Sometimes there are a lot of debris or parts inside the ear canal. So that again, we need to clean under uh, microscopic guidance under anesthesia. So uh, if you have facilities, if you have instruments, if you have a headlight under direct vision, you can try removing the insect or the uh, tick. And a, a wick, a small cotton wick, impregnated with antibiotic uh, steroid uh, cream uh, will help to reduce the canal inflammation and edema then comes the common topic otitis acute otitis media uh, here the infection is in the middle ear and you can see a an angry looking red inflamed bulging tympanic membrane it is usually following an upper a respiratory tract infection and 95% of the time it is viral. Uh, the, uh, the background uh, problem is uh, there is eustachian tube obstruction due to this upper respiratory tract infection where you don't ventilate the middle ear properly. So the secretions accumulate, the infection sets up and it is a condition uh, common in children where they present with fever uh, and earache. Uh, initially, we don't see a discharge because the in eardrum is intact. But if you don't treat it properly, the infection might perforate the eardrum and then you see a discharge in the outer ear canal. Uh, the moment the eardrum is perforated and discharged, the earache goes off. So we think that the patient is cured, but not. It's the condition has got worsened. Uh, and there is an eardrum perforation uh, releasing the pressure in the middle ear. So uh, as we all know, we have to have analgesics, antibiotics, uh, and there's no place for eardrops if the eardrum is intact because it's not going to go in. But you can have uh, nasal sprays 
to reduce the inflammation in the nasopharynx and to open up the eustachian tube where it helps to uh, relieve the pressure in the middle ear. Uh, systemic antibiotics are controversial, but in children less than two years with high fever and other uh, background problems, we uh, recommend systemic antibiotics. This is another picture showing a cartwheel appearance again seen in acute otitis media. Uh, this is a picture where you see a fluid levels uh, and trapped air bubbles in the middle ear. Uh, this is the condition we call uh, commonly a glue ear. When you have you take in this tube obstruction or dysfunction chronically, the middle ear is uh, the middle ear. There is secretion of fluid into the middle ear. This secretion is sterile. There's no infection. And the eardrum is uh, uh, the retracted. And the trapped air in the middle ear is slowly absorbed, leaving behind a fluid levels and air bu bubbles inside. This is a chronic problem. If you see glue ear, this needs uh, a proper ventilation of the middle ear. If the eustachian tube is obstruction, we sometimes uh, put grommets to, to the, mid, uh, the tympanic membrane to uh, ventilate the middle ear. So again, if you see a chronic ear like this, uh, where you see the retracted tympanic membrane, the ossicular chain is uh, very prominent and visible. You see fluid levels in the middle ear with uh, air bubbles trapped inside. That again needs specialized uh, intervention and referral to a specialized center. The other condition we uh, usually uh, miss in our general practice is this mastoiditis. Uh, usually in children, uh, uh, infection in the middle ear spreads to the mastoid and they present with mastoid infection, painful, swollen uh, ear, ear. But if you press on the mastoid tip, they don't have anything. But the swelling, pain, redness is above because that's the most uh, least resistant uh, uh, area in the bone. So it comes out from the upper end of the ear. ear. So if you press on the, uh, the mastoid process, you will not elicit any clinical signs. But if you carefully look uh, behind the ear, you will see the infection or the redness or the swelling pushing the pinna forwards, emerging from the upper end. So again, you need systemic antibiotics uh, and referral to a specialized center. Uh, chronic eardrum perforations. Uh, as you see in this picture, the, the outer margin of the perforation is very uh, fibrotic and you see the contents of the middle ear. The problem with eardrum perforation is that the sealing between the outer and the inner is lost. So any infection from outside can go inside and cause recurrent ear discharge. People have noticed. Um, Patients coming with repeated infections or repeated ear discharge, chronic ear discharge, you have to see whether there is an eardrum perforation, sometimes missed, because uh, it's not uh, it's not big perforations all the time. You can have tiny perforations connecting the outside and the middle ear. So, uh, if you see a eardrum perforation. Uh, the first thing that you need to advise the patient not to let water in because water is the uh, risk factor or water is the thing that carries infection from outside to inside. Unless you have a discharge or signs of infection, we don't normally uh, put ear drops onto these dry perforations. And uh, if the patient is presenting with repeated recurrent infections, uh, that is another risk factor to uh, 
lose hearing as well because the infection spreads to the inner ear and little by little it affects the inner ear uh, nerve system and the and you end up with um, not only a conductive hearing loss due to the perforation but a sensory neural hearing loss as well so if the patient presenting with repeated recurrent infections you need to have a culture to see what the in organism is because sometimes some some uh, organisms are resistant to com commonly used ear drops so culture is a must uh, dry ear precautions is a must and uh, if the re repeated infection you need to uh, uh, refer them for surgery to uh, seal off the eardrum perforation also uh, traumatic eardrum perforations as you see you can appreciate the ragged edges of the ear, the perforation as compared to the smooth fibrotic uh, edges of the chronic perforation so they the, they have can have uh, uh, blood clots over and the ragged uh, edges of the perforation usually this happens with the uh, accidents uh, uh trauma to the ear uh, sometimes uh, bomb blast victims firecracker injuries a uh, lot of various people come with traumatic ear perforation traumatic ear perforations usually heals on its own uh, provided that you maintain an adequate dry ear precautions uh, because um, if water goes in from outside to in it carries infection and the ear gets infected so the per traumatic perforation is not going to heal so dry ear no water in the ears and you can give systemic uh, oral uh, antibiotics antihistamines and a nasal spray to open up the eustachian tube and you can review the patient in a month's time to see the ear, the traumatic perforation is healed very well. I have seen patients taking more than one month's time, uh, two to three months, but most of the time, traumatic perforations heal on its own, provided you prevent any infection in them. This is again a picture showing the blue ear. So the chronic otitis media is because of these chronic infections. And another condition that I just want to mention is this nasty uh, condition we call the cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma is a condition where you get trapped squamous epithelium in the middle ear. And it acts as a, a local uh, tumor destructing all the surrounding structures it's not a cancer or a tumor per se but this name is given because it acts as a tumor destroying all surrounding structures the ossicular chain uh, the ear canal uh, ear drum and it can spread up to the brain it can spread into the mastoid cavity and it causes recurrent repeated ear discharge so this again uh, needs a referral to a specialized center uh, where you need to uh, surgically uh, excise everything, remove all cholesteatoma and repair the defect. So if you get recurrent repeated ear infections, you need to exclude a cholesteatoma, you need to exclude a chronic eardrum perforation where you have a lot of infections. The next topic uh, in um, ear is the is vertigo as we all know vertigo is a feeling of rotation uh, it can be subjective or objective where the surrounding is moving or the person himself uh, is uh, sensing that the that they are moving uh, balance is a complex issue and uh, 70 percent of the balance is maintained by the vision and 15 percent of the by the inner ear balancing system and other the 15% is by the uh, new, neuro, neurological coordination. So we ENT surgeons, we lot of see uh, patients uh, with vertigo involving the peripheral balance system. 
fortunately or unfortunately most of the treatable causes are within the peripheral balancing system uh, therefore the uh, the 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 conditions the majority which cannot be treated also labeled as uh, inner inner ear issue and referred to us so ent causes for vertigo the commonest one is bppv benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and the second one is menias uh, the third one is vestibular neuronitis and labyrinthitis. There's a lot of other conditions which can cause uh, vertigo, but if you can identify a patient with BPPV, differentiate it from many years and differentiate the vestibular neuronitis and the labyrinthitis, that is more than enough for your GP practice. So uh, what is BPPV? Uh, BPPV is where you have this autocornea, usually it's in a, a pouch, utricle and the saccule. For some unknown reason, the, 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 the autocornea dislodge into the semicircular canals. Uh, the three semicircular canals angle to 90 degrees to each other and where they stimulate the, uh, the, the labyrinth. So each head movement, the autoconia moves around within the endolymphatic compartment and stimulates the balancing system. Uh, so BPPV is uh, with head movements, uh, the true vertigo lasting for minutes and it settles down in the uh, external or uh, the uh, semicircular canals. So every time mo you move your, uh, your head, it stimulates the balancing system. So there's no hearing impairment. Uh, vertigo doesn't last more than minutes, uh, but always, most of the time, it's with head movements. So current brief episodes of true vertigo with position change in the position of the head uh, lasting for minutes, seconds to minutes, uh, usually associated with nausea and vomiting. Uh, but I, I must stress this term. All positional vertigos are not benign and it's not always vestibular in origin. So how to diagnose whether there is this uh, autoconia movement in the inner ear vestibular system. We have to, we can do this Dixall Pike maneuver where you uh, tilt the head in a certain angle and stimulate the balancing system of the inner ear and see whether the patient experiences any vertigo or we, we see the uh, nystagmus of the ears. So if you confirm that it is BPPV by doing a Dixall Pike test. Uh, we can see whether it's the right side balancing system or the left side balancing system. And accordingly, we can do a, a plea maneuver to relocate the autoconia into their original utricle and the saccule so that the patients get better. So there are contraindications uh, to do this IPLI maneuver with patients with severe neck disease, high grade carotid stenosis. Uh, we do normally attempt uh, relocation manuals. And the patients are given advice um, to maintain a certain position at least for 24 hours and to avoid certain neck, head and neck movements. So uh, BPP is a clinical diagnosis uh, done with the uh, uh, history itself and confirmed by a Dixall Pike test. And the treatment is Epley manual. But we usually give uh, vestibular sedatives like beta histidines uh, to control the acute symptoms. But uh, if you don't do this uh, relocation maneuvers, it's going to uh, repeat, repeat or it's going to come back again. So if you have patients um, with BPPV, and if you are not competent enough to do a, a pre maneuver or a relocation, manual better to re refer the patient to a specialized center. Uh, vestibular neuronitis is another common condition. Uh, usually it's secondary to a viral infection, uh, not a recent one, but maybe within a 
within two weeks time uh, they have true vertigo nausea vomiting positional imbalance uh, labyrinthitis also have the same features except uh, vestibular neuritis there is no hearing impairment but in labyrinthitis there is hearing impairment the, his the, the history is more or less the same uh, secondary to a viral infection uh, vertigo lasting for days it's not minutes it's not seconds it's not hours but it's lasting for days uh, with nausea vomiting positional imbalance in vestibular neuritis there's no hearing impairment but in labyrinthitis there is hearing impairment uh, so in treatment there's this inflammation in the labyrinth if you don't do anything it will take about a week for this to spontaneously settle down but if you treat with uh, anti-inflammatory medication we usually use steroids uh, it will enhance it will uh, improve the symptoms uh, quickly so treatment is corticosteroids we usually give methylprednisolone or prednisolone antiviral treatment if uh, with acyclovir and uh, treatment will uh, make sure early mobilization and if the patient having recurrent repeated uh, imbalance we usually refer them to vestibular rehabilitation therapy done in the physiotherapy department uh, where you strengthen the other inputs to the vestibular system to maintain balance so again to recap the labyrinthitis same as vestibular neuritis the only difference is you have hearing impairment in labyrinthitis but not vestibular neuritis so uh, we have seen a lot of patients being diagnosed as labyrinthitis but uh, actually most of the time it is vestibular neuritis Meniere's disease is another common condition where you get uh, spontaneous attacks of vertigo lasting for hours uh, this is because uh, in the labyrinth, uh, the semicircular canals, uh, there, are, there is endolymph and perilymph in two compartments. For some unknown reason, the endolymphatic pressure builds up. The endolymph and the perilymph is at a constant production and constant reabsorption where the pressure is maintained at a balance so we we uh, we really don't know what the cause is but we assume that it may be a increased production or a decreased reabsorption uh, which makes the pressure inside uh, the endolymphatic compartment uh, rises so uh, in classical manias in the history if you ask the patient complains of first it starts with ear block and then uh, the, uh, the the pressure builds up in the endolymphatic compartments and the membranes are stretched and they experience a tinnitus a noise in the ear uh, 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 affected so uh, 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 ear fullness tinnitus and then uh, at the maximum pressure level they lose their hearing so uh, uh, ear fullness tinnitus deafness then they start vertigo so the classic the most of the people give this classical history of fullness tinnitus deafness vertigo fullness tinnitus deafness vertigo and they they are really bad and they have vomiting nausea vomiting and uh, the the uh, the vertigo lasts for hours so in history if you ask them properly fullness, tinnitus, deafness, vertigo, it is many years. So it's a clinical diagnosis like BPPV, like vestibular neuronitis, like labyrinthitis, many years, uh, there's hearing impairment, there's uh, fullness, deafness, tinnitus, vertigo. So uh, sometimes people get recurrent, repeated attacks of many years, then you have have to put them on uh, prophylactic medication to prevent them getting from infections and acute infections are again treated with vestibular sedatives anti-inflammatory medications and sometimes steroids also 
uh, plays a role uh, in treatment. And uh, to reduce the production of the endolymph, we put them on uh, medis medication like CT, uh, where we, uh, we think that it will help to reduce the production of endoliv, and also we put them on beta histidines uh, where it has a vasodilatory effect. So we assume that it will have more reabsorption of the endoliv. So ultimately, we try to balance out the pressure in the endolymphatic compartment. Um, so in many years, um, we have hearing loss, tinnitus, fullness. Uh, with debilitating vertigo lasting for hours. So this is the this is what I've already told you: diuretics, vasodilators, and general general measures. Also, but there's no proven uh, research proven benefit. But we all do adopt general lifestyle adaptations like uh, stress reduction and low salt diet. So these are the other causes. For you to have a, a peripheral vertigo, superior semicircular canal lesions, and these are very rare conditions uh, to uh, experience. Another important topic is hearing impairment or deafness. These are all what we already know. The star, there has to be a sound stimulus, and it has to be conducted, and uh, through the eardrum, the ossicles, the middle ear, and to the inner ear, the cochlea, and to the brain. This central, uh, this, this uh, uh, sound signal has to be conducted to the inner ear, then it has to be sensed, and the nerve has to send the signal up to the brain. So there are basically two types of hearing loss that we encounter. One is a conductive hearing loss and the other one is the sensory neural hearing loss. We do get patients with mixed hearing loss where you have a mixed conductive and a sensory neural hearing loss. Um, if we are to elaborate on the causes for conductive hearing loss, even impacted wax, foreign bodies or keratosis obturans, which I've talking, uh, spoken, spoken to you, can cause a conductive type of hearing loss. Then the middle ear effusions, otitis media, eardrum retraction, adhesive otitis media, barotrauma, uh, also can uh, cause a conductive type of hearing loss. Then the ossicular chain, the stapes, commonly the stapes is fixed to the uh, foot plate, uh, is fixed to the oval window so that the sound waves are not conducted through properly. Uh, some conditions like glomus tympanicum, where you have uh, abnormal uh, blood vessels in the middle ear, uh, causing conductive hearing loss. Uh, sensory neural hearing loss, the causes are uh, with age, you get presbyacusis, uh, Meniere's disease also ca causing hearing impairment. The noise-induced hearing loss is a very common condition nowadays and autotoxicity with autotoxic drugs, uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, conditions like vestibular schwannoma also can uh, end up with sensory neural hearing loss. So when you come across a patient with hearing loss, you have to do otoscopy to see whether there's anything obstructing the outer ear canal. And in your setup, you can do a free field voice assessment where you, uh, uh, where you uh, test uh, one ear, uh, two feet, and six inch, you can you can whisper or uh, uh, use the conversational voice to see whether there is any uh, impairment. If you have a tuning fork test, you can do a Weber's or an Inez test. Um, uh, the basic audiological principle that we test here is air conduction is better than bone conduction. So if you uh, if you uh, strike the tuning fork and keep it uh, anterior to the ear canal and then behind the uh, ear on the mastoid process you can um, see what the better one is air conduction or the bone conduction through the mastoid bone so um, 
usually the renase is positive meaning air conduction is better than bone conduction but if you have any uh, conductive deafness uh, the renase test becomes negative the bone conduction is better than air conduction this is one test where you get a positive result in a normal patient usually i mean most of the time the positive result is something abnormal but in the renase test renase positive is in normal patients weber's test you keep the tuning fork on the vertex and see the lateralization of the uh, noise sound so the weber's lateralizes to the side where you have the uh, conductive hearing loss and the specialized test that you can do, uh, especially in children, uh, you can do an auto acoustic emission uh, to see whether there's any outer hair cell dysfunction. You can do a PO tone audiogram. Most of you all have asked how to interpret a PO tone audiogram, uh, which I'm going to discuss in, in another few minutes. And you can do impedance audiometry. Uh, uh, another word is. Uh, uh, tympanogram where you see uh, where you assess the condition of the middle ear and again in children where you uh, where they cannot respond to these pure tone audiograms and all we do a uh, brain stem evoked responses so in pure tone audiogram you get a graph like this so in uh, in one axis the x axis you get hearing loss in decibels starting from 0, 10, 20. And in the y-axis, you get the frequency 125 to 8,000. Now, there are two lines in the audiogram. One is air conduction and one is bone conduction. In a normal person, the air conduction, bone conduction goes together. There's no gap between the air conduction and the bone conduction. And the, the normal hearing level or the hearing threshold in decibels is 20. So anything above 20 goes together is normal. So this is a normal audiogram. In a conductive deafness, there is a gap between the air conduction and the bone conduction. So if you bridge this gap, the hearing level is above 20. So this is purely a conductive type of hearing loss there is air bone gap and it is above 20. in a sensory neural hearing loss again the air conduction bone conduction the graph goes together but it is well below the normal uh, level which is the 20 decibel uh, level so this is a pure sensory neural deafness and this graph you see the low frequencies the low frequencies you have a gap and the high frequencies is goes together so there is a sensory neural component as well as a conductive component so this is a picture or a graph of mixed type of hearing loss again this is a normal audiogram where you have both air conduction, bone conduction goes together above 20 decibel, normal hearing threshold. This is a pure conductive deafness where you have a conductive gap, but if you bridge the conductive gap, it goes up to the normal hearing level. This is bone conduction and air conduction goes together, but it is below 20. And this is a sensory neural deafness. And here you have a mixed hearing loss. This is how you basically interpret uh, a pure tone audiogram. Impedance audiometry, where you uh, measure the middle ear pressure and uh, see whether you have uh, any middle ear pathology. You get a type A graph like this, where you have uh, a peak around zero, plus or minus 20. Within that, range this is a normal uh, graph where you have a flat sort of a line with 
um, or a, uh, uh, the peak is not that prominent uh, where you get in autosclerosis and the, you have a very high peak where you uh, see in ossicular dislocation and a flat graph like this in midlier infections. So the hearing loss, you have to identify the cause and treat accordingly. In conductive hearing loss, uh, in children, you can uh, have grommets, hearing aids, sensory neural hearing loss, you can't do much hearing aids. And sometimes uh, babies coming with congenital hearing impairment, uh, warrants cochlear implants as well. So this is one condition we all should know and you have asked questions about it. Sudden sensory neural hearing loss. It is a sudden event where it affects the sensory neural component. Uh, most of the time, the paper patients uh, tells you that they wake up the next day morning and they don't hear. So it's an ENT emergency. Uh, usually they give a preceding history of viral uh, type of upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, most of the time it occurs in uh, diabetic patients, elderly population, uh, following a viral type of upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, sometimes uh, cerebral uh, CP angle tumors also can present with sudden sensory neural hearing loss. So if you if you uh, read, read read about it, there are a lot of risk factors associated with sudden sensory neural hearing loss. So whatever it is, if it is sudden sensory neural hearing loss, there is a small window period that uh, is available for you to treat. Twenty four to forty eight hours. If you don't treat properly within that window period, your patient is going to end up with a dead bear. Uh, so if a patient coming with a sudden sensory neural hearing loss with respiratory tract infection, don't attribute it to phlegm because we have seen patients coming to us uh, attributing that sudden sensory neural hearing loss to phlegm and they come late uh, so that we are unable to do much with them. So the main aim of, uh, main uh, stay of treatment is steroids. We, re we recommend high dose oral steroids if you are to give about 60 milligrams prednisolone uh, daily for about five days. But unfortunately, as I said, these, these patients are mostly having diabetes. So we are unable to give high dose steroids. Uh, now we have researchers proven that uh, giving steroids to the middle ear uh, will absorb that through the uh, round window to the inner ear, which will eventually reduce the inflammation in the labyrinth, thereby improve the sensory neural hearing loss. So nowadays we give intratympanic dexamethasone to the middle ear and we leave the patient for about half an hour on the couch uh, 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 head turned to a side so that we we allow the steroids or the dexamethasone to absorb through the round window to the inner ear so if you do this within 24 to 48 hours uh, the results are excellent but after that also up to two weeks, you can have some improvement, but after that, uh, there's hardly any improvement. So unfortunately, uh, we have seen patients ending up with dead deer where you cannot prescribe a hearing aid even, because for us to um, have a, a hearing aid, there has to be some residual hearing. If you don't have residual hearing, the device cannot amplify. So for us to prescribe a hearing aid, the patient has to have some residual hearing. So it's a ENT emergency where we all should be aware of. 
so moving on to uh, the nasal conditions uh, now this is a picture of a foreign body in the nose we most of us come across these conditions um, especially in young children preschool age because they have to develop this pincer graph for them to grasp a small tiny object and direct it right into the nose so if you see a foreign body like this you have to remove it uh, you have you have to have a proper light source direct vision uh, you have to put your instrument, uh, a wax hook or something. Some people use these uh, uh, hair pins also with, uh, 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 with the proper way. So you have to go beyond the, uh, the, the foreign body and drag it forward. Otherwise, it's going to go in. And uh, unfortunately, we have seen sometimes it goes and drops onto the th uh, throat and sitting on the larynx causing um, uh, dangerous effects so so again ear foreign bodies like this we need to i have to talk to you about this so this is an x-ray showing a coin in the uh, in the neck area So, uh, if a patient or a child or an adult coming with a history of uh, foreign body in the throat, what should we do? Uh, we have to make sure whether this foreign body is in the airway or the uh, esophagus. So, in the history, if you ask them properly whether they had any, any episode of cough during this scenario uh, especially in children the mother says the patient had the child had uh, intractable cough during this uh, pr swallowing procedure so that means whatever the foreign body has irritated the vocal cords so i am sure every one of you all have experienced a um, uh, uh, this kind of choking episodes while eating so you the the body tries to get rid of this in the airway by uh, coughing and that uh, cough reflex tries to bring whatever inside the airway out so uh, if the foreign body is in the airway you have to uh, uh, take the foreign body out under controlled in a controlled environment in the theater with all necessary equipments around and if it is in the esophagus again uh, have to take it out but most of the time the foreign bodies in the esophagus uh, passes through the uh, system and there is only one place that it can get obstructed that is the ileocecal valve so if the foreign body uh, somehow gets through this ileocecal valve, it's going to uh, end up in the with feces. Uh, but we normally advise uh, to refer the patients to the specialized center for the foreign body removal and in a controlled environment unfortunately most of the time we have no time for such uh, referral because the child or the person is coming with a choking episode so uh, uh, in a if you witness the 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 uh, the event uh, and uh, people recommend to do this heimlich maneuver but if the patient is stable do not please do not do this heimlich maneuver because it will dislodge a stable foreign body to an un unstable level so if the patient is stable with the foreign body inside do not do attempt or do not uh, do this uh, heimlich maneuver and other things which can dislodge uh, the stable uh, 
foreign body. Uh, so the throat, the most importantly, it's the vocal cords in the throat. This is a picture of a normal vocal cord where so you see the white glistening appearance of the vocal cord. And this is a picture where, where you have a cyst in, in one vocal cord. And this is a polyp in the vocal cord. And these are bilateral vocal cord nodules where you see in people who use their voice uh, or abuse their voice. Uh, so what? how does the patient present with uh, these uh, vocal seeds, polyps, nodules to you? Usually, they present with hoarseness of voice, the voice change. It's another important topic that we need to consider. Voice change lasting for more than two weeks without any improvement to your treatment warrants a vocal cord assessment. Because uh, simple uh, viral infection, common cold, cough, also the voice is crooked, voice is hoarse, and there is uh, dysphonia. Sometimes the, you lose your voice completely, but once the infection is settled, once the edema of the vocal cord settles, uh, the voice improves within tw uh, two weeks. But if it is going beyond two weeks, this can be a malignancy, uh, this can be a vocal cord cyst, or this can be a polyp in the vocal cords, where it is not going to improve with your simple treatment. So the message here is that you need to refer the uh, patient having voice change more than two weeks uh, to a specialized center for uh, vocal cord assessment and uh, treatment accordingly. So in our centers, where when you refer the patients to our centers, we do a fiber optic uh, laryngoscopy to see the uh, state of the vocal cord. This is a picture where you see uh, one vocal cord is very irregular edematous and uh, unhealthy. So this is a cancerous vocal cord. This is again a, a cancerous uh, vocal cord where you have, uh, where you do not have enough space to breathe through. So if you don't uh, refer these people timely, the hoarseness of voice ends up with a stridor. So the glottic space is compromised, they don't have enough uh, breathing space, uh, gradually they develop stridor and uh, end up in the hospital with uh, where you are, where we are unable to do much for them. So the message here is any voice change lasting more than two weeks without improvement to your basic treatment, refer to a specialized unit. Uh, then the next condition we uh, come across is uh, problems with the tonsils. Usually uh, the tonsils, it's not the size per se, uh, but the infection uh, as you see in this picture, the tonsils are inflamed, infected with pustules here and there. Uh, the size uh, is about uh, grade three here, uh, obstructing the airway. Uh, and in children, large tonsils can cause uh, uh, snoring, mouth bre uh, obstructed breathing and that itself can impair their growth as well. So recurrent repeated infections tonsils. The guideline says 
uh, if you get more than seven episodes of acute tonsillitis in a particular year, the tonsils needs to come out because each and every uh, uh, infective episode, the person loses productive uh, time period from their lifetime. So the children lose their education, the adults uh, cannot attend to their day-to-day -day routine, the, uh, their occupation, whatever. So if you get more than seven episodes during a year, uh, the tonsil needs to come out. Uh, if you consider two consecutive years, more than five each year, uh, tonsils needs to come out. Three consecutive year, more than uh, three episodes each year, the tonsil needs to come out. So acute tonsillitis, you can treat with uh, gargles. Uh, I usually uh, give uh, Coca-Cola uh, gargles for children because it's a very good antiseptic and it reduces all these debris in the uh, throat. And the small children would love to have Coca-Cola gargles rather than having salt water. So it's a very effective one. I give my uh, post-tonsillectomy patients also Coca-Cola gargles. It's very effective. So you also can try Coca-Cola gargles in any throat condition. Uh, so throat, tonsillitis, whatever. Because sometimes betadine mouthwash or betadine throat gargle, it has iodine and some people are a bit... Uh, allergic can be sensitive to iodine so if you don't uh, dilute it properly uh, it might cause more inflammation than good so uh, coca-cola uh, throat gargles and mouthwash is a very safe and effective alternative to betadine mouthwash um, and this is a picture of uh, two tonsils which have been removed uh, so the message here is uh, so throat, recurrent tonsillitis, uh, more than seven episodes per year or two consecutive years, three consecutive years, uh, repeated infections, uh, refer to a specialized unit to get the tonsils out. Some people do uh, put these uh, patients on prophylactic antibiotics and I'm not an antibiotic fan and I don't recommend, uh, especially children, putting on prophylactic antibiotic because uh, the prophylactic antibiotic uh, will attack the normal common cells also. So it's, uh, it invariably uh, reduce your innate immunity as well. So I normally don't recommend to put uh, children on prophylactic antibiotic uh, because nowadays uh, surgery is safer than ever. Uh, moving on to the nose, this is a, a, a famous picture of the nose uh, showing the uh, inside and its connection with the sinuses around. Uh, and this is a simple uh, X-ray sinus OM view, occipital mental view. Uh, if you order a sinus X-ray, please mention OM view so that we are, you get a good uh, view and interpretation of the uh, sinuses. And we are, the, here you see the right side, there is a fluid level in the sinus and the left side, there is a little bit of thickening of the mucosa of the sinus. Uh, this is actually a, a X-ray of an acute sinus infection, acute sinusitis. You see fluid levels in acute sinusitis. Uh, if you see a fluid level in the sinus, you can treat the acute episode. You don't need any further investigations uh, uh, for this. Uh, you can steam, ask them to steam the nose, uh, nasal sprays, um, and uh, steroid based nasal sprays, uh, and uh, decongestant nasal sprays. Uh, antibiotics and antihistamines. Uh, the message here I want to give you is most of the people use decongestant ear drops and sprays for a longer period. Oxymetacillin, xylometacillin, 
decongestant beer drops we don't recommend to use on long term basis because uh, it can cause a condition called rhinitis medicamentosa uh, the moment you take uh, uh, the stop uh, decongestant it has a rebound phenomenon it is blocked again uh, the the rhinitis medicamentosa so we don't recommend using decongestant nasal drops or decongestant nasal sprays uh, at a stretch more than two weeks but i have seen uh, patients on decongestant medic uh, sprays for a long time without their knowledge but uh, steroid based nasal drops or sprays can use for a long time but not decongestant nasal sprays uh, this is a CT of the sinus showing a opacified maxillary sinus and also uh, hypertrophied inferior turbinate on the left side. This CT, usually we do a sinus CT, a non-contrast CT, where uh, you get recurrent, repeated attacks of sinusitis. Uh, acute infections you treat accordingly, but if they present with recurrent repeated infections, uh, do a sign non contrast sinus CT to assess the condition of the sinuses because sometimes uh, 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 phlegm or uh, material within the sinus is not going to go off with uh, oral medication and it needs a surgical clearance uh, for the patient to get better. This is a picture where you see uh, swelling of uh, periorbital cellulitis. The uh, redness swelling of the eyelids around the, uh, uh, the orbit periorbital cellulitis. This is again uh, could be secondary to uh, ethmoid sinusitis usually. Uh, the infection spreads from the ethmoid sinuses uh, through the thin lamina papyracea to the orbit and the uh, tissues around. So if you see a patient like this, uh, periorbital cellulitis, periorbital swelling, uh, just think whether this could be due to uh, sinus in origin. Other common uh, uh, condition is nasal collapse. Uh, so in this picture, you see the glistening uh, uh, polyp here and the turbinate adjacent to that. And sometimes these nasal polyps are so big and they grow very fast. So they emerge through the nostril as well. Uh, you need to know how to differentiate a nasal polyp with a nasal turbinate because we have seen a lot of uh, patients coming to us with a lump in the nose uh, but to see these are hypertrophied inferior turbinates rather than a nasal polyp so it's very easy because if you uh, see some pictures or some if you examine each other so you see the inferior turbinates bulky red uh, with blood vessels and they are, they are sensitive to pain. If you touch it, they, they feel the pain. But polyps, they are usually insensitive. And uh, the color is a bit different to the turbinate. Like this. So the turbinate has, is vascular with a lot of blood vessels. And it is pain sensitive. Whereas the polyp is uh, usually uh, pain free and uh, hardly any vascularization. So uh, bilateral nasal polyp inflammatory type is 
usually secondary to chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, unilateral nasal polyp, uh, for that matter, usually is secondary to a neoplastic process. So if you see unilateral nasal polyps, uh, you need to investigate further and uh, a biopsy or uh, removal of the polyps. But bilateral inflammatory type nasal polyps, secondary to rhinosinusitis, uh, we can do a medical polypectomy uh, to start with. Medical polypectomy is with uh, steroids, uh, antibiotics, antihistamines, uh, nasal sprays. So steroid, we prefer prednisolone. We can start with a dose of 20 milligrams daily for about a week and then reduce it to a 10 milligrams daily for another week. And we can combine it with a macroloid like clarithromycin. Uh, the newest guideline says chronic uh, rhinosinusitis with polyps. Medical polypectomy, you can use uh, a, a, a macroloid like clarithromycin, 250 milligrams twice a day up to six weeks. Uh, so, uh, uh, steroids, macroloid, antihistamines, and a steroid based nasal sprays. Uh, usually, medical polypectomy works. If it doesn't work, you have to refer the patient to a specialized center because either it is uh, the diagnosis is wrong or they have another, uh, another undiagnosed condition. Usually, medical polypectomy works, and you can once the 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 steroid does the work, uh, you can uh, maintain it with steroid nasal sprays and antihistamines. But if it is a unilateral nasal obstruction, unilateral nasal polyp, uh, without response to medical polypectomy, needs a specialized uh, uh, referral. Uh, for your interest sake, we do uh, surgeries endoscopically, uh, no external scars. And this is a picture which uh, a unilateral uh, antrochoenal polyp, which I've removed recently. So this is what I have told you, the hypertrophy of the turbinate, hardly any space for the patient to breathe through. This is the normal uh, turbinate, not swollen, uh, plenty of space room, the black color area for the patient to breathe through. Uh, this is hypertrophic turbinate. This is again secondary to uh, rhinitis, inflammation, chronic inflammation. So it doesn't go off within a day or two, but you have to continue your steroid based nasal sprays antihistamines at least for a month or two uh, for this uh, hypertrophy turbinates to uh, reduce in size so i hope i have uh, covered most of your queries and uh, most of the common things that you encounter in your day to day practice i am happy to uh, answer a few of your questions Thank you very much, Madam, for that very insightful lecture. Um, we have a couple of questions. First question is from our audience concerning the foreign bodies or ticks in a ear, especially when it comes to ticks in a ear. If, as a in our general practice, if we see the tick adhered either to the TM or the canal, how do we differentiate the management in an OPD setting, Madam? Uh, uh, at an OPD, OPD setting, setting you, you see the tick in the canal. The canal. Uh, if you uh, have if you a good light source, source, if you have, you a, have a tiny, tiny crocodile, crocodile, and, uh, and uh, just, just you can you just can remove, just remove it. it. No, don't, don't worry about, about the canal drama. drama. Anyway, the tick is going to grab some of the surrounding tissue with with it. So uh, in the canal, you can remove and you can put a wick, as I told you, impregnated with an antibiotic uh, uh, steroid combination cream. And that will reduce the uh, bleeding and the inflammation as well. But if it is 
adhere to the tympanic membrane uh, with the pain you might not be able to reach uh, there in the opd setting uh, and because of the pain the patient might not let you uh, touch uh, it and do the procedure properly so if you can again uh, remove it remove the tick and put a wig uh, because it's like a traumatic perforation in the eardrum, it will heal on its own spontaneously, provided that you uh, advise the patient not to let water in. But usually, if the, uh, the tick is adhered to the tympanic membrane, we recommend it to be removed under general anesthesia. Uh, next question, Madam, concerning tonsillitis. If we have a patient uh, who presents to us as tonsillitis, should we directly start antibiotics, especially if it's a postural tonsillitis, or do we go for a pharyngeal swab and culture matter? Uh, uh, I would say uh, the first episode, uh, if you see the postural tonsillitis, postures in the tonsils, you can start antibiotics. But in repeated recurrent infections before starting antibiotics, take a swab. Uh, next question is also concerning tonsillitis. Madam, you mentioned about uh, Coca-Cola gargling. The audience uh, want to know what, what, whether it's how safe it is or whether we should go to a preparation with low sugar or is there any... No, uh, no. Uh, no. no. It's, it's, it's very it's safe. safe. Uh, I mean, we don't recommend it to drink, uh, but to throw it out, gargle and throw it out, whatever the preparation you have, low sugar, with sugar, whatever, uh, it's very safe and it's very effective. Next question, Madam, concerning medical polypectomy. How long should we give the oral steroids and how should we taper the dose? Uh, that again depends on the background problems the patient has. If the patient is having diabetes and you have to monitor their blood sugar levels, if it is not well controlled, uh, you can safely start about 20 milligrams per day for a week and then 10 milligrams for the second week and tear it off. But in a healthy, young, fit adult without comorbidities, sometimes we go up to uh, 30 milligrams per day. Uh, days, days, 34 days, 24 days, 10, 4 days, likewise we can gradually tear it off. Another question, madam. Uh, this is concerning how do we instruct our patients to take the steroids and the decongestion nasal drops? How should we advise our patients? Uh, steroid uh, nasal sprays, um, we can use it uh, uh, twice a day. Morning, night or morning, afternoon, twice a day maximum. If the conditions are settling, we can step down to a uh, daily dose in the night so uh, step up step down step up step down as and when needed so provided that you uh, don't get any better with twice a day dose for some time uh, you can add the decongestant again twice a day or if it is uh, responding to a daily dose and gradually stop the decongestant and continue the steroid so time to time, you can boost up with a decongestant in between, but to continue the steroid nasal spray maximum twice a day. Madam, next question is, um, after a patient presents to us after undergoing polypectomy, uh, what are the surgical complications that we should look out for in general practice? Uh, one thing is bleeding and infection and also uh additions in in inside because uh, the traumatized nose uh, if you don't if the patient don't uh, clean it properly we advise them to uh, clean it with normal saline uh, douching uh, so if they don't clean it properly they can have uh, tissue uh, additions so additions um, you have to look for and then infections uh, where you have parulent discharge and then bleeding. Uh, bleeding here and there up to two weeks is normal following nasal surgery. But it, if it is continuous beyond that, uh, we need to uh, have a proper assessment. Another question, Madam. Uh, in the OPD setting, how do we manage an episode of choking attack in a child? Um, um, as I told you, uh, if the child is stable don't attempt anything 
because you are going to uh, unstable the stable foreign body but if the child is not responsive and uh, uh, and that you are sure that the airway is obstructed uh, you can turn lateral uh, hit on the back and uh, a small child, and uh, you have seen in these pictures, you can uh, uh, lift up with the uh, legs and uh, tap at the back, or you can even put your finger in and try to remove the foreign body from the throat, or uh, in a uh, uh, young adult or a person, you can do the Heimlich maneuver even. So uh, the problem is, uh, don't unstable the stable foreign body. If the foreign body is stable, let it be and try to remove it in a controlled environment rather than in an OPD setting. Uh, we can, we have, yes, very limited time. But another question is concerning the medical polypectomy. Uh, can it be even attempted for unilateral polyps? Uh, unilateral, uh, unilateral polyps are uh, very unlikely going to go. Uh, or with medical polypectomy because medical polypectomy is recommended for uh, polyps secondary to chronic rhinosinusitis and they are usually bilateral uh, with a history of chronic rhinosinusitis. So medical polypectomy we normally don't attempt for unilateral. Uh, unilateral polyps needs further investigations to rule out a malignant or a um, neoplastic process. Okay, one final question, madam. Just an overview on how long do we have to treat a patient for sinusitis in an OPD setting before seeking a specialist uh, opinion? Uh, acute sinusitis, usually within two weeks, it should settle. But chronic rhinositis, if it is going beyond three months, uh, we need to have a specialized opinion. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the time we have today, madam, oh. for our question and answer session. We thank you again for being very active and participating in this very interesting topic, which is very applicable for our everyday practice. So if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to email us at officeri13 at gmail.com. We will try to get your questions across to madam and get you an answer. We are also planning on having another follow-up lecture because this is a very vast topic and there are a lot of questions that we got that need addressing. Uh, other than that, we have opened our lines to a WhatsApp group. I have posted the link on your chat box. Please uh, add in to the chat group so that we can send you daily updates, weekly updates on our upcoming lectures. Um, finally, thank you all for your very, very interested participation on today's very interesting topic. And uh, we hope that you will join with us next Sunday also with a new topic, with a new lecture at the same time. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Madam, for that very informative very and very precise lecture. And, and we hope to welcome, welcome you again another, another, another day for another new session, session on this topic. topic. Um, please, please keep in touch with Sri, and, and we will update you again and again and how our processors of the CPD webinars will be going. Don't, Don't forget, forget to fill in the Google form at the end if that is posted on your chat box to obtain your CPD certificate. And the CPD certificate will be giving you CME points for your professional development. Thank you. Thank you and hope you have a lovely Sunday.